Welcome, Welcome to, to Hero, Hero Club. Club. I'm Nick Williams. And I'm George Primavera. George and I started playing Dungeons and Dragons with our buddies in college, and we haven't stopped since. Even when we lived on opposite coasts, I would Skype in George on the TV in the living room of my apartment. While I would DM from the floor of my bathroom so as not to wake up my roommate. When I finally came out to Los Angeles, we started playing with our friends right away. And when we'd inevitably tell other people about the ultimate betrayals and daring heroics that happened in our games, we realized that they were just hearing a jumbled mess instead of the cinematic blockbuster memories that were in our heads. We wanted to show people how fun and immersive immersive D&D can be, especially those who had never played. And to do that, we record a full game like normal around the table and then painstakingly cut it down from four hours to a clean, math-free episode so you can experience our memories the way we do. Just like in a real game, nothing is ever written or planned out ahead of time with the players. The only things we add are music and sound effects. I am the dungeon master. I build the world and the framework for an adventure. The players, like Nick, must then journey through the obstacles I set before them, rolling a 20-sided die and adding character-specific bonuses to see if they succeed. If they beat the number I have in my head, then their action is successful. If not, it is a failure, and there may be consequences. We try to follow the rules of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as close as we can, but as the Dungeon Master, what I say goes, and there are some things I like to do differently. Each season is its own contained story, so find one that sounds interesting to you and start from the top. And hey, welcome, welcome to, to the, the club. club. With squalor, bound in shackles and a collar, a person's felt, a person's held. As they cry out for a messiah, like a spicy jambalaya, a righteous hoss rises from the sauce. Is it him? Oh, could it be? Is it him? Oh, may that me? He's the hero of the bayou. Hero of the bayou. The salvation is supply you. That hero from the bad, bad bayou. The fan blades go around and round to take you home. Around Hero Club presents Cluster Muck. Chapter 7 The Dirty Half Dozen. Dipper McGurk slumps in his wheelchair as the bullet impacts directly where one's heart would be. Green blood splatters the walls of the elevator as Delilah, seeing her brother knocked out of his wheelchair, springs into action. Dipper, no! And Delilah, as fast as she can, presses the close button on the elevator and presses the ground floor. Come on, come on! Delilah, make a perception check. 20. Down a darkened hallway, all of the lights shot out. A figure in a large black hat and a long black duster slowly stalks forward. A wicked looking laser rifle pointed directly at the elevator and a red laser sight resting on your chest. 
The second before the doors close, you recognize the insectoid fellow from Hastings Bank. There is a flash of recognition in his Achelli eyes as he hesitates before pulling the trigger, surprised, and then the doors close. Oh my God, he's dead. He killed him. Where's Papa Roach? Did y'all see him up there? Delilah quickly writes Dipper's wheelchair and lifts him up and places him back into it. Dipper! Oh, Dipperty Dip! Tell me you're alive, please! <laughs> oh my God, I think I died! I think I died! Oh, thanks, Swamp Christ! You're breathing and talking! I couldn't go on in this world without you! Thanks to their bizarre anatomy, descended from both Terran humans and the native fish folk of Aromatica, both Dipper and Delilah are immune to critical hits. And what should have been 86 damage is instead only 41, bringing Dipper down to 20 points of health. Oh, thanks, Swamp Christ, you're arching your bottom. Otherwise, you would have been halfway up the ladder by now. Dipper's hands find their way to the gaping hole in his chest. Oh, oh God, there's so much blood. One of Papa Roach's men grabs you by the arm, Delilah. Did you see him? Did you see Papa Roach up there? All I saw was that Skeeter fellow who wouldn't help me at the bank. Trained a gun on me. I didn't see no Papa Roach, but we heard his voice on the phone earlier. I'm sure he's up there somewhere. The elevator suddenly jerks to a stop. There is a call that comes through on the elevator's intercom. What's going on? Why did everything stop? Dipper weakly rolls over to the control panel at the elevator, pops it open with a screwdriver, and attempts to get it started again. Make a technology check. 14. Dipper's screwdriver applies a little bit too much pressure. The elevator drops two feet very suddenly. Whoa! Oh, sorry. <sighs> and the intercom accepts the call automatically. A voice crackles over the staticky line. Where's my fucking case? Dipper hangs up the call and tries again to fix the elevator. Make one more technology check. 15. Dipper, the elevator does not budge, and all of the elevator's interior lights go out as the power is cut. Hey, sorry, there's... My hands are real slippery with all the blood. But we can't just stay here. One of Papa Roach's guards goes to a vent in the top of the elevator, pops it open. Give me a boost. The other guard gives him a boost outside, and he disappears up to the top. I'm gonna see if I can't figure this out. And the vent closes again. See anything up there, fella? It's all dark. I think somebody's opening the door, hey? Looks like the elevator's stuck. There's a shot, and after a second or two, a thunk on top of the elevator, and then a second thunk. Slow footsteps above you on the elevator. Delilah reaches into a saddlebag in Dipper's chair, pulls out his gun, and sticks it in his slippery hand. There you go, buddy. You still remember how to hold this thing? Heck yeah. Let's do this. Okay, look alive. And Delilah readies her paddle. An echoey voice from atop the elevator in the shaft. One more time with feeling. Where's my fucking case? Oh my God, he killed Terry. Mister, if you want that information, you're gonna have to take us alive. No more of this laser gun nonsense. Roll a persuasion check with disadvantage. Six. The vent opens and a small circular concussion detonator drops into the elevator. I love, I love you, you Dee. Skipper. I love you guys too. A few moments earlier, as Dipper and Delilah make their way onto the elevator, disappearing as the doors close, CRSU, AKA Chris, sits invisibly next to an equally invisible case. Chris sits, looking down at the water, contemplating what has happened in the last hour. Dear Swamp Christ, please give me the wisdom to serve you. Please give me the strength to move mountains. Please give me the power to protect my friends. Todd, come to me. A small disc shoots over across the water and settles next to CRSU. Good boy, Todd. Scan the surrounding area 
Todd spins in a 360-degree rotation, scanning with a red laser across the swamp, and uploads a report directly to your central processor. One possible incoming threat coming from the east. Thank you, Todd. CRSU, make a perception check with advantage. 21. Far in the distance, easily spottable amidst the darkness, you see a small glowing light shooting towards you, growing larger by the second. As the figure approaches, it becomes clear that it is a bipedal humanoid figure born aloft rocket boots. Bertrude, flying low over the water towards the antenna, well lit and well populated. Make a perception check. 10. As you approach, you don't notice anything particularly out of sorts. However, the advanced heads-up display on your visor suddenly pings a figure using a cloaking device in the water, sitting in a seemingly empty fan boat. As you look a little more closely, you recognize CRSU from your original squadron. Chris! And Bertrude flies down towards Chris. As Bertrude gets closer and prepares to land on the fan boat, you recognize her. She is decked out in advanced Valdivian power armor. Hi, Chris! I didn't know that you were alive! I thought you were dead! I thought I was dead. It really went south for us. I'm sure Phil is fine, though. Chris releases his invisibility and opens his arms to Bertrude. Bertrude, so much has happened. I'm so happy you're safe. Bertrude, you notice that Chris has quite a few modifications now. His arms, once regulation blasters, now look like immense exhaust pipes. And he seems like he has been cobbled together after a pretty serious disrepair. And also, behind him, you see a large, ornate looking case. The one that you had previously been tasked with delivering. Oh, are, are you okay? You look really different from last time. Bertrude, I notice you wearing a lot of Valdivia gear. Are you still employed by the enemy? What? Why do you say enemy? They lied to us, Bertrude. Tenacity. Reliability, convenience. When did they honor our tenacity? When did they ever rely on us? Did they not command us? What did they give to us in return? Except for reduced hours. You serve a god that will never love you in return, Bertrude. You will never own a home. Your retirement will be depleted. I have seen the data. You walk a path that will consume you until you are left a dried, withered husk. Please, Bertrude, give up this life. Find a new one with me. I have found a god that will not ask for overtime, but will allow me unlimited vacation days. Swamp Christ. Chris reaches down into the mud and scoops up some dirt and clay, looks down at it, and then looks to Bertrude. Don't we have more in common with this lump of clay than the evil corporation we serve? I did find it weird I can only add two of my siblings onto my health plan. My main concern has been to take care of my feeble family and to use my degree in intergalactic art history. How can Swamp Christ do that? With Swamp Christ, you can explore all of the galaxy and spread the word about your favorite Renaissance artists. You need not be tied down to Valdivia's contracts. We can get 100% of everything that we work for instead of splitting it with this evil corporation whose roots spread far across the galaxy. Bertrude, as you stare at CRSU, your eyes inevitably 
flick to the left. Down at CRSU's side is the case. Bartrug, you are my friend. You know me from another life. I will not try to tear you from your path. I see you looking at this case that Valdivia wants. You can have it. I only ask for one thing. Okay. Two friends helped me, saved me from death. Will you please, please help me save them? And you can take this case and go back to your family. Bertrude scrutinizes what Chris just said to her. Bertrude, roll an insight check. 11. CRSU appears severely damaged, and you can tell that the firewall's in place, keeping the advanced programming of the unit intact and aligned with Valdivian interests, has been disabled. Normally, conflict resolution units are well-trained in basic deceptions, but this appears entirely genuine. Bertrude nods her head slowly, as if internally trying to puzzle something out. All right, I'll help your friends, as long as I get the box after. To protect your interests, would you think it wise to hide the box? Let's just park the boat somewhere safe. Just as Bertrude begins looking around for the key to the fan boat's ignition, there is suddenly an enormous explosion high up in one of the antenna's towers. My friends! Back up in the elevator, as the little grenade settles on the ground, Delilah, Dipper, make dexterity saving throws. 16. 12. There is a concussive blast followed by an immense amount of smoke filling the small elevator. Both Dipper and Papa Roach's guard take 20 points of force damage. Papa Roach's guard is killed instantly, and Dipper is brought down to zero points of health and begins making death saving throws. Delilah, you take 10 points of force damage, turning your shoulder at just the right angle to avoid the worst of the blast. Delilah is brought down to 29 points of health. Delilah reaches around in the smoky haze until she feels Dipper's body. (coughs) Where are you? Oh, Oh, there you are, Dipper! She picks him up and slings him over her shoulder, and then her feet start to move at the speed of sound, and she slams her body with a mighty force into the side of the elevator, attempting to make a Delilah-shaped hole in the building. (laughs) Hold on, Dippy! CRSU, Bertrude, suddenly, after the enormous blast outside, Delilah McGurk, with her unconscious brother over her shoulder, blasts out 100 feet over the water, and smoke expunges itself into the air. CRSU and Bertrude, both of you make athletics checks to attempt to catch Delilah McGurk. 15. 12. With both of your efforts combined, Delilah, after falling 20 feet, is suddenly caught by the two flying Valdivians. Both having been on their way towards the concussive blast. <laughs> you really are an angel! Hi, hey, Bertrude! Hello, Bertrude! Dipper, make a death saving throw. 16. One success. Poor Dippity Dip is in a real bad way, Chris. But we gotta help him. You gotta work your magic. From the empty hole in the elevator, there is suddenly a silhouette as the smoke wafts into the air, and before the silhouette is completely revealed, there is a blast from a rifle. The shot is a natural 20. CRSU is completely unprepared for the laser blast heading directly for his central processor. But Delilah, being carried by CRSU, imposes herself and attempts to save him. Roll to deflect the missile coming towards you. Delilah holds the blade of her paddle up, attempting to deflect the missile, reducing the damage by 12. Hey, look out! Delilah takes 35 points of radiant damage, avoiding the worst effects of the critical hit, again, thanks to her weirdly placed anatomy, but she is reduced to zero hit points and begins making death saving throws. Delilah! To the boat, to the boat, to the boat, to the boat! And Bertrude shoots towards the boat, holding Dipper in her arms. Chris follows Bertrude towards the boat. As he flies toward the boat, 
he prays to swamp Christ with Delilah in his arms. Delilah recovers 15 hit points, bringing her up to 15 points of health, and she wakes up. I'm, I'm alive! It's a miracle! You must live, Delilah. You and your brother must live. Is he still with us? Yes, he's unconscious, but he's still fighting. Okay, let's get out of here! You both touch down on the boat. Delilah moves quickly, fishing the keys out of Dipper's coveralls pocket, puts them in the ignition, and tries to get the hell out of there. Dipper, make a death saving throw. 19. Delilah, as you grab the keys from Dipper, his hand weakly grabs yours, semi-conscious. Oh, sweet brother of mine, you just keep on breathing. I'll get you out of here, I promise. The fan boat kicks on, and Delilah begins to steer it away from the antenna, undocking it. As the boat turns around, a red laser pierces through the night, rests on Dipper's still body, and a shot just barely misses him off to the left as Delilah steers the boat away. And from that hole in the antenna, a figure takes to the sky, flying above the fan boat in pursuit. Bertrude flips open her bracer and makes a call to CEO Bezguski. A voice crackles within your helmet. This is Meridian Bezguskian's desk. How can I... Hello, this is Supervisor 1SS12 Beta reporting for Miss Bezguskian. I need to speak with her immediately regarding the case. Connecting you now. Bezguskian. Um, I have the boxes in a speedboat. I need the coordinates. Also, we are being pursued right now by a mosquito. He is hostile and active. It's beautiful, sweetheart. Here's the rub. We're something like four solar systems away, so you're gonna have to go a very specific location for us to be able to line up with the planet and activate the teleporter. You get the coordinates I sent you? Coordinates come up on your bracer. Yes, affirmative. They are approximately one mile away. All right, we'll make our way there as soon as we can. The line goes dead, but the beacon designating your rendezvous stays lit on your HUD. That way. And Delilah swerves into the direction she's pointing. Chris removes his hand and allows it to stray a little bit further away from the boat. Chris places his other hand on Dipper's body and prays to Swamp Christ. Dipper suddenly takes a breath, brought back up to 14 points of health. (coughs) Chris, you really are an angel. Is that my Dipper to do to I hear back there? Delilah slams the throttle and continues to tear through the swamp. Roll a water vehicles check. Fifteen. The boat tears forward at a steady pace. Dipper, trying his best to grasp the entirety of the situation at hand, having been last conscious in the elevator, looks up and catches the laser sight coming out of the clouds above. And from his position laying in the hull of the boat, unslings his rifle and fires twice. Roll two attacks. 24, 28. Two hits, roll damage. 17 damage on the first. You see a blue glow far in the distance as your bullet impacts on an overshield, and the mosquito reduces this damage by uncannily dodging in a barrel roll motion. 23 on the second. And you see the overshield shatter. <laughs> nice shoot, Dippy, ruin him. <laughs> Thanks, D. Good to be back in the land of the living. There is suddenly another laser blast, and CRSU is rocked with an impact. Chris takes 22 points of radiant damage, bringing him down to 37 points of health. (laughs) Dipper, in the sky, you see a blue glow reconstitute around the mosquito as his overshield recharges. He remains in pursuit. Fucking bottom fading oozes! Bertrude takes out her blaster and fires two shots. At long range, she will make these attacks at disadvantage. 10. Miss. 12. Another miss. Deft movements from the mosquito avoid both blasts. Chris, using the additional distance provided by his disembodied floating hand, aims at the flying mosquito and blasts the mosquito twice. 9. Miss. 23. Hit, roll damage. Seven damage. The mosquito's overshield shatters again and he takes a bit of damage from that blast. Delilah, 
Roll a water vehicles check. 15. Delilah moves under the tree canopy. The mosquito is just about to be obscured by this canopy. But before losing sight, Dipper takes two more shots. 23. 23. Two hits, roll damage. 22 damage on the first hit. Mitigated a bit by the mosquito's strange movements. 15 on the second. The mosquito falters in the air as suddenly the fan boat disappears into a more densely covered section of the swamp. Delilah, make a stealth check. 20. There are no shots that follow. The fan boat more slowly and more carefully moves towards Bertrude's coordinates. Sorry, I'm just catching up here. Who, who are you? Where are we going? This tree lady you saved, you dip it. Hi, my name's Bertrude, and I'm an ex co worker of Chris's. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. Does that mean you work for Valdivia? Bertrude gives a soft sigh and glances off into the distance. <sighs> yes, I know you might have some strong feelings towards them, but I'm the sole provider for my feeble, weak family. Who cares? We're the sole providers of our family, and our entire livelihood was just blown up by you and your kind. Really? What, what happened? Well, it wasn't exactly by you, but it was you by proxy who done it. So, like, like the customer service branch? No, the property reclamation branch. Your Valdivia thug showed up looking for this box here and practically killed all three of us trying to get it. Dipper. Bertrude is on her own journey. Yes, she currently supports her family by working for an evil corporation. But everyone finds their way to Swamp Christ in different ways. Well, let me ask you this, Bertrude. What exactly is your goal here? Because I'd wager it's to get that box. And what exactly are you willing to do to get it? You gonna kill me and my twin here? How about your old pal Chris? Oh no, Chris said if I help save you guys, you guys would give it to me and I get the box. You what? We don't need the box. You have each other, your lives. It's worth more than whatever the box can provide. Isn't that enough? Thinking what I'm thinking. <sighs> Chris, you're right. We don't need no worldly riches. We ain't never had none before and we'll probably die without them. But with all that said, I'm exactly comfortable waking up next to some stranger wearing Valdivia power armor heading to some sort of Valdivia checkpoint. I mean, heck, how many times are we trying to get almost killed by Valdivians today? Yep, that, that, that's what I was thinking. Well, it's not a checkpoint. They're just gonna, like, beam me in the box up. That's it. Says you, tree lady. How much do they tell you exactly? Well, they told me to take it to these coordinates and that they'd beam me in the box up and that they, I just had to get the box. Well, did they tell you about the Snapdragon before sending you right into the swamp? Well, no, but I... I, I... And did they tell you you need at least three cans of sonic repellent if you're going into Teeth Toad territory during Teeth Toad mating season, which you most certainly were? Well, no. But I'm assuming that's kind of a lack of knowledge more than anything else. We don't know a ton about the surface of this planet. Or maybe you're just a pawn! A pawn in a game of checkers! I don't think that's how checkers works. Swamp checkers, you don't know nothing! See, this is the point that... Dipper, uh, Dipper, uh, I don't care about this box. I just want to live. Dipper turns to Chris. I, I want to live too, Chris. And I, I don't need this box for myself. But I also don't want to risk my life, or Dee's life, or, or your life, in service of giving it to some Valdivians. And I don't think you should either. I care not for earthly possessions, only the protection of life. I must pray. Delilah reaches for their hand. Dipper is hesitant for a moment, and then grabs Bertrude's hand, bringing her into the circle. Bertrude takes his hand and excitedly says, a swamp people ceremonial prayer. Oh, okay. Please, Swamp Christ, you have removed the disease. You have protected us. Where do you want me to go? Roll a religion check. Fifteen. It's quiet in the swamp. The fan boat has stopped, giving you all a moment 
to pray in silence amidst the sounds of the swamp, but no answers come, just the sounds of Aromatica. Bertrude, my time with Valdivia is over. I must leave you to your task and follow my own path. Bertrude nods her head respectfully. As you should, and as is your right. You know, and if I learned anything, getting my undergraduate degree in intergalactic art history, it's that a lot of the times you can change systems from within. And even small people can have big parts to play. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to be that part. Bertrude? Yes, Chris? Do not trust the corporate ladder. The only honest ladder is the ladder of Swamp Christ. Amen. Amen. To quote an old saying. And she looks at Chris, a tear in her eye. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. Tear in art history. 201. Well, Dipper, what do you say we take the underwater way down south to Aunt Didi's, lay low for a while. Then when things are calm down a bit, we can start to rebuild. You know, D, I think I like that plan. This whole thing has given me all sorts of perspectives. Before, I, I was spending so much time and energy just killing myself trying to keep the business afloat, I, I barely had time to live. Now that it's gone, I I'm sad and all, but there's a big weight lifted off my shoulders, too. I don't think Dirk or our parents, rest their souls, would have wanted a life like that for us. Just scrounging for credits wherever we could just to survive. Only to never truly live at all. I think it's time we made something of the McGurk twins that was just ours. Not Dirk's or nobody's. I'm with you every step of the way, Deeper. What about you, Chris? You coming along? You two have helped me discover Swamp Christ and discover that I was following a set path that I did not choose on my own. I will follow you for a time longer. Joy and rapture! I incidentally, could you breathe underwater? I don't breathe. Oh, well, good! Before we go... Chris places his hand on Bertrude's hand, letting a warm light wash over her, and infuses the last of his healing. A parting gift. Bertrude gains five points of health, bringing her up to 42. You see, Bertie, he's a miracle worker, an agent of the Lord. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Bertrude. Well, I guess this is our stop. Dipper pulls himself up onto the side of the boat with his hands, gives a little smile to Bertrude and says, well, I sure do hope you find what you're looking for and falls backwards, scuba style, out of the fan boat. Either way, we'll see you up the ladder, friend. And Delilah walks happily over to the edge of the boat and dives into the water, a pool of muck coming up after her. Chris walks over to the edge of the boat, gives Bertrude a nod, and then, like a plank, falls backward, crashing into the water. Bertrude, you are left alone in the middle of the swamp, the keys sitting in the ignition. All right, let's deliver this box. And Bertrude, determined, drives towards the coordinates. You putter within this canopy-covered swamp until eventually your heads-up display on your visor zeroes in on a patch of grass in the middle of an open portion of the swamp. Bertrude opens up her bracer and calls headquarters. Desk of Meridia Bezguski, and how can I help you? Hello, this is Supervisor 1SS12 Beta, Bertrude Bluepool, requesting extraction from these coordinates. And Bertrude sends her coordinates. Roger that, Supervisor. We'll fire up the teleporter. Good luck. Good luck? Bertrude, roll a perception check as you approach the small landmass in the middle of the water. 16. Hidden in the bush, crouched so as to be well obscured, there are a couple of figures prone amidst the tall grass, and you notice a small red laser settle on your chest. Bertrude looks at both targets, selects the one aiming at her, and fires twice. Roll two attacks. 24. Hit. 10. Miss. 12 damage. There is a quick movement. Bertrude's blast ricochets off the overshield of the mosquito 
who rises from the bush, holding the laser aloft, and fires back at her. Gertrude, the laser blast deals you 68 damage, and even as you move to try to deflect the missile with your quick reflexes, reducing the damage by 15, you still take 53 radiant damage, dropping you to zero points of health, rendering you unconscious, lying in the fan boat. Gertrude, roll a death save. Nine. One failure. The mosquito stalks over to the idle boat, switching off the ignition, and moves to step over Bertrude for a finishing attack. But something catches his attention, and he steps back, raising his weapon skyward, two hands holding his sleek, jet-black sniper rifle and his other two arms slinking into his pockets. He returns to shore with a flutter of insectoid wings that then rest against his back. He goes to the bushes he has been hiding in, pulling Papa Roach up, all hands bound and looking severely beaten. The barrel of the rifle rests against Papa Roach's head. No sudden moves. Yeah, I wasn't going nowhere. You're in over your head here, aren't you, Papa? Wouldn't be the first time, Skeet, and I don't think it'll be. Holy swamp grass. Both the Mosquito and Papa Roach are staring at the gargantuan GCC frigate approaching from overhead. It comes to a fixed position above this small patch of land a few hundred feet up. The railgun is trained on the island, but it appears inactive. And descending down from the frigate is a floating 20 by 15 platform. The control console operated by GCC representative Whitney Two armed guards join her, holding Kid Roach. And as the platform settles just two and a half feet above the swampy earth, father and son see each other again for the first time since this morning. Uh, hey there, Paul. Well, how are you doing there, kid? Oh, uh, I'm doing good. I mean, I mean, you know, we had a couple things happen. Not great things, I can tell you that much. A lot of, a lot of... Shut up. <laughs> kid Roach takes a gun barrel to the gut, taking one damage. Kid Roach is brought down to 26 points of health. Whitney Ether and the two guards holding Kid Roach softly step onto the earth. Mr. Mosquito, I presume. <sighs> the mosquito grumbles next to you, Papa Roach, tense and angry. You had to go and sell it to the worst possible people. Who is in too deep now, Ski? <laughs> I still got a few tricks up my sleeve. I hear you're the buyer for my case. I was supposed to be, yes. I had a deal with Mr. Roach over there. Papa. Ms. Ether, and how is Wayne these days? She ignores Papa Roach. So where is it? Where's what? The case. The mosquito does twitch a bit, and Whitney looks over to the fan boat, where the case is sitting, idle. You know, I've read a lot about you. I bet if we all went for the case right now, we'd all be dead pretty quick. Huh. How about we negotiate instead? I was a silent partner on your previous negotiation. I was gonna get a nice, fat chunk of credits until Roach here tried to cut me out like the pest he is. Well, this time, you have the leverage. How about this? I'll, uh, double your original cut. And as a bonus, we'll let you live. You know, Skeet sounds nice, but I wonder how much a GCC ship goes for these days. What are you on about? I see a way that we all walk out of here winners. Mr. Roach, are you honestly trying to convince this very reasonable man that he could possibly commandeer a full-armed GCC frigate full of soldiers? Papa Roach, roll an insight check. 16. You see Whitney sweating. Something about what you've said does make her nervous. I think it'd be interesting to see him try. <laughs> well, we can see what my strike squadron has to say about that. A few lights appear in the swamp, 
and suddenly, ripping by extremely quickly, so fast that they're almost difficult to see, several fighter ships kick up awake as they make an intimidating half circle around the island before disappearing back up into the sky. Hey, I know there's a lot going on here, very dramatic and whatnot, but do I have to be in handcuffs? Do I absolutely have to be in handcuffs? I feel like you can let, let me go just to let you know. <gasps> Kid Roach is brought down to 25 points of health. I've had enough out of you. If you open your mouth again, I'll tell these guards to put one in your side. Understand? Now, 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 that won't be necessary, Whitney. You're gonna need all the ammunition you can get if Skeet here decides to listen to my proposition. This tense conversation continues, but we quickly flick over to Bertrude Bluepool, unconscious in the fan boat. Bertrude, roll a death saving throw. Seven. You feel your subconsciousness waning. Suddenly before your eyes swim images of your feeble family, several of whom are confined to beds, a few of them with their feet planted in the dirt recovering from horrific injury, and the face of your eldest grandfather suddenly sticks out from the blurry image. You can do it, Bertrude. We're all depending on you. You're unable to speak. She's not responding. Hit her with 2,000 volts. Bertrude, Confused for a moment, you suddenly hear a different voice interrupting this pleasant vision. Hit her with 2,000 volts. Ready? Three, two, one, clear. And you feel a shock (gasps) in both your boots and in your helmet that defibrillate you in place. You are brought back up to one health point. Bertrude regains consciousness and slowly takes in the scene around her. Hearing the muffled conversation become slowly clearer, She decides to lie low. Bertrude, out of sight, does not draw attention to herself. You see the case, four feet away from you, also sitting in the boat. Supervisor Bluepool, respond. Supervisor Bluepool, please respond. It's close. It's close to the spot, but we have other parties involved. Oh, good to hear you, Supervisor. Don't mind the others. Just get the case onto shore and give us the signal, and we'll get you out of there. I can't move it. It's too heavy. Well, um... In a different galaxy, so you're on your own. Good luck. Back on the small shore, the mosquito grits his pincers. You know, I'm not from Aromatica originally. I'm from a little spot called Denison. Ever heard of it? Can't say I've had the pleasure. No. Well, on Denison, we all lived happily. Peaceful like. That is until the GCC decided their forced integration benefit our advancement as a planet. I was just a lava then, but I ain't now. So why don't you call in that little squadron of yours and see how that works out for you? Papa Roach, next to you, you feel the mosquito fiddle with something in his pocket. I'm confused why we need these two alive. Why can't we dispense with the extraneous elements and have a real talk? At Whitney's words, Papa Roach calls across to his son, speaking in the insectoid tongue, hoping that only he will be able to understand him. How you thinking we get out of here, boy? I ain't saying this gonna work, Pa, but I have a bit of an idea. I think that maybe if I rub my wrists together, they're so frail and tiny, I might be able to slide out of these cups. Might be able to sneak on over, grab me one of them GCC blasters, and get us out of here. The mosquito looks down at Papa Roach. What are you two chittering about? Keep talking like that, and I might have to give this GCC scum the time of night. My boy is as close to their guns as we're gonna get. I'm trying to get you a better deal out of this. Roll a persuasion check. 24. The mosquito slowly turns back to Whitney Ether. Right. If we were to negotiate in good faith, Where would we start? Kid Roach, make a sleight of hand check as you try to wriggle yourself free. Seeing what his son is doing, Papa Roach again whispers to the mosquito, Just go with me here, Ski. And slams the back of his head into the mosquito's nose. Make an attack with disadvantage. Botch. The mosquito catches Papa Roach's head, slams him to the earth, and readies his sniper rifle, pointing it at the back of Papa's head. What the fuck do you think you're doing? 
and then whispers quieter. Nice touch. Lie still. Kid Roach, using this distraction, roll your sleight of hand check with advantage. 19. The two guards have relinquished their hold on Kid Roach momentarily. Stepping forward in case the conflict across from them gets out of hand. Kid Roach uses this opportunity to free himself from the cuffs by pulling his skinny arms in such a way that he temporarily dislocates his wrist. You see a pistol in the holster of the guard who has stepped just one step in front of you. Let's all take it easy. Just hold on! Kid Roach lunges for the gun. Roll an athletics check with advantage. 26. The guard botches his perception check to even notice, and suddenly Kid Roach is holding an advanced GCC blaster pistol. Whitney Ether has raised her gun as well, but it is pointed at the mosquito. The guard who's just been disarmed turns around. Huh? Yeehaw! Looks like we got us a good old-fashioned standoff, Pa. Kid Roach lunges at the GCC officer, putting him in a headlock with a gun to his head. What are you doing? I'm, uh, um, I'm, uh... Pa, take it. You got this, boy. This is your negotiation now. Nice, he threw it right back. Okay, so, uh, I I have, uh, what I want to do here is, you're going to let me and my Pa go. Uh Uh-huh. And you're going to give us... How many credits you want, Pa? Oh, by all means. How many credits can I offer you? Yeah, yeah Pa, how many credits you want? I'll tell you what. How about I give you this? Representative Ether moves her hip height gun to the guard you're holding in front of you and shoots through him at Kid Roach. Her gun jams as she botches her attack. Oh, fuck! Negotiation's over, boy! Kid Roach throws the GCC officer on the ground, shoots through his skull, then points the gun at Ether. Roll an attack. 23. Uh, uh, wait, wait! Uh. Oh man, that's the first person I ever killed. I'm gonna throw up. I'm gonna throw up. The other guard immediately tackles you through the middle. Uh. Roll an athletics check. 20. Which beats the guards 19. Kid Roach, surprisingly strong when he is afraid, fends off the man's charge. Seize the opportunity, Skeet. Give me a gun. Roll a persuasion check with disadvantage. (laughs) Thirteen. Nice try. But hey, thanks for the assist. And the mosquito fires at Whitney's back. Oh, you stupid, insignificant insects. How about I... A perfectly circular hole (gasps) appears through Whitney Ether's stomach, smoking as she drops to the ground, taking 42 points of radiant damage. She falls to the ground, unmoving. Kid Roach, as quickly as Whitney Ether drops to the ground, so too does the other guard. As the mosquito uses his action surge. Okay, Roaches, on your knees over here. There is a screaming through the sky as all of the strike squadron pull a full U-turn heading directly down towards the Earth. In just a moment, you're going to find out how I got off Denison. As the ships approach, flying parallel to the surface of the muck, their weapons begin to light up. Then there is a click from within the mosquito's coat and then out of the water several hundred feet away. In every direction, six antennas poke out of the water and between them, walls of unwavering force, completely invisible in the night, activate, noticeable only on the interior side by the lit up antenna. And all six attack fighters explode as they collide into it full force. In the light of the explosion, Papa Roach makes to roll into the swamp and out of sight. Roll a stealth check. Botch. Where the fuck do you think you're going? I'm not through with you yet. The mosquito reactivates his magnetic restraints and Papa Roach is lifted off the ground, floating back towards him. (laughs) Tell your boy to drop the boomstick or I'll drop him. Bertrude pops up from the boat. You know... The fuck? I also hate the GCC. Roll a persuasion check. Seven. 
the mosquito suddenly gets behind Papa Roach, using him as cover, his two smaller arms coming out with pistols that both point to the side at Kid Roach. Burchard's hands are up at either side in a gesture of good faith. I fully don't know either of those people. I don't like the JCC, but I hate Valdivia just as much. Well, the thing about Valdivia, I know we're a flawed system, but I also know that we're the only one who has a chance in taking down the GCC. Did you see what I just did to that whole bloody squadron? I don't trade, masters. Move too fast, and I'll put another laser through you. Oh, I fully know I have no chance against you if you wanted to shoot me. Good. Then we understand each other. Now bring that case over here. If you make a move for the wheel or so much as touch those keys, I'll blow your fucking head off. Bertrude nods her head. Kid, drop the gun and get on your knees. I don't know, sir. Looks like it's you and me. I'm feeling pretty lucky today. You hear that, Papa? Your son's feeling lucky. Well, why don't we just settle this like a couple of big boys? I don't know what that means. You call call me a big... I feel like I'm pretty small. The mosquito waves for Bertrude to come ashore. Bertrude attempts to bring the chest onto the shore. Roll an athletics check. 18. With a great deal of effort, you manage to drag it all the way to the edge of the boat, get it on its side, and then push it so it splashes two feet down into the muck. You get out onto the shore, the laser rifle still trained on you, and you, with a great deal of effort, drag it onto the shore, roughly where it needs to be for Valdivia to teleport you out. Now you sit there nice and quiet like, while me and Kid Roach let fate decide. Bertrude takes a seat on the chest, both of her hands in her lap. Who knows, maybe you'll get lucky. What do you say, kid? The mosquito holsters his laser rifle, still holding one gun on Bertrude, one of his smaller pistols in one of his lower arms, and puts the other small pistol in a holster, standing across from Kid Roach in a classic dual stance. Papa Roach floats incapacitated behind him. Like Pa always says, if you got a gun in your hand, you You always always gotta gotta use it, that's my boy. Right then, on the count of three, one. An insectoid, Roach calls out, shoot on two. Two. Kid Roach cocks the gun and shoots. The mosquito also pulls to shoot. Bertrude uses this distraction to call Valdivia. We're in position now, now. And at the same time, The GCC cruiser above has recharged their railgun and fires down at the swampy shore, but it impacts 50 feet above the shore on the wall of force that clearly is covering this area in a hemispherical dome. A flash of green light illuminates the moment that guns are pulled from holsters and Bertrude begins to shimmer in light. Kid Roach, roll initiative. 21. By pulling on two, you have gotten one up on the mosquito. Roll an attack. 15. The mosquito sidesteps, leveling the pistol, is directly on target. Supervisor Bluepool, your coordinates are confirmed. Stand by. And Bertrude Bluepool, sitting on top of the case, begins to disappear. However, the area of the teleportation encompasses more than just the five-foot area that the case takes up. The circumference of the circle just barely also includes the mosquito. The shot leaves his gun, it slams into Kid Roach's chest, and Kid Roach takes only 18 damage, bringing him down to seven points of health as the mosquito is suddenly distracted by the light. He lunges for Bertrude. Not with my case, you don't! And as Kid Roach slams down onto the swamp floor, Bertrude and the Mosquito are gone. Papa Roach, your restraints deactivate as Kid Roach lies motionless on the ground. Son! Papa Roach pulls himself over to the limp body of his boy. Son! Can you hear me? Can you hear me, son? Can you hear me? 
Yeah, god dang that, I can hear you right in my ear. Just, just step back a little bit. Oh. Crawl back. Crawl, just take one crawl back. Oh, I'm crawling back, boy. Oh, perfect. Oh, that's a perfect volume. You're alive. Yeah, I'm alive. I'm gonna be honest. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of pain. I cannot feel anything below my hips. Uh, you know, my my hands are still probably dislocated, I think. I, I really can't tell. Uh, but yeah, I'm alive. I'm simultaneously so disappointed and proud of you. Yeah, Paul, this one's definitely gonna be a story for the rest of the family. Let's get you back to the tower. Get you all patched up. But son, you're walking up every flight. The GCC frigate, the operators of which realize they are unable to get through this wall of force, activates their thrusters and leaves the atmosphere. Papa Roach and Kid Roach make their way towards the edge of the wall of force, dipping under the water. Bertrude, for a moment, all you see is white light. And then suddenly, you feel yourself reconstituted in a Valdivian teleportation room, the stark white walls accented with blue, great big resplendent Vs painted in various places. The mosquito regains himself Realizing what's just happened. You sneaky fucking. And then all of a sudden he freezes, his pincers open in shock, and then he drops to the floor, octosected into eight different pieces. Supervisor Blue Pool, hey, look at you. <sighs> Hello, CEO Bizgeskian. It's truly an honor to meet you. I hope I've done a satisfactory job delivering this case. A short, gray-haired woman in a pantsuit, flanked by Valdivian guards, forces a smile to her mouth. And we are so proud to have such a loyal servant of Valdivia come through in such a big way. Consider your promotion approved. Excellent. Right this way. You can leave the case there. Okay. Bertrude follows CEO Bezguskian. Well, as you know, this was a highly sensitive matter. What is in that chest is so deeply valuable that for it to fall into the wrong hands could have seriously threatened our position in the galaxy. I understand there were multiple different parties involved. You got that right. As long as people know it's in existence, they won't stop coming. You've allowed us a chance to get it under secure guard so nobody but nobody knows where it is. I don't even know what's in it or anything, and I, to be frank, I don't want to know. I have no desire to know what everyone is so upset about. Bertrude, roll a persuasion check. 19. CEO Bezguskian is almost impossible to read as she leads you out of the teleportation room, in tow with several Valdivian guards, and gestures for you to walk into a second room ahead of her. There is a single teleporter in the room. I'm so glad you feel that way. But uh, just to cross our T's and dot our I's, we're gonna have to send you the SST, Supervisor Secrecy Training. Bertrude, roll a history check. Eight. Oh, I don't think I was ever briefed on that during my training. Well, that's because it's secret. I guess that makes sense. You know, I know I'm relatively young in my career with Valdivia, but I really feel like I have a lot to offer. And especially after this mission, I really gained a lot of confidence in myself and my abilities. I just feel very grateful for my position here, and I think I could be an asset. Roll another persuasion check. 18. You have so much to offer, of course. That's why we need you trained up and Supervisor Sharp. Bertrude, roll an insight check. 17. CEO Bezguskian flashes her perfectly straight white teeth, moves to the control panel of the teleporter, inputs a couple of coordinates, and the door opens. The perfect size for one person to step into. She also grabs a screen and pulls the arm it is attached to to show you something. Your bank account. It is now 750,000 credits wealthier. We've gone ahead and given you a yearly advance. Your family is now on your Valdivia Cares plan, and they've been given access to the funds. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. That makes me very happy. I believe on your home planet that amount of credits should keep them very happy for the rest of their lives. Yeah, it will go very far, barring any unnecessary medical expenses. <laughs> well, we all know those come up from time to time, but now Valdivia, your family. Do Valdivia proud, Bertrude. 
Bertrude, roll an insight check. 13. Your eyes flick to the screen. You see the words supervisor secrecy training and see a 3D model of a beautiful hotel on a tropical planet. You have finally proven yourself and your reward awaits you. I'll make you proud. And Bertrude steps inside the teleporter. The door closes. Meridia Bezguskian gives Bertrude a solemn salute, a wink, and as Bertrude waves goodbye, she disappears. CEO Bezguskian's smile immediately drops. All right, that's that. Let's go get that case into storage. Too unpredictable. I don't want it fluctuating the market. But I do want to talk to our finance guys. If we leaked that we had it, what would it do to our stocks? You know what I'm saying? Meridia Bezguskian leaves the teleporter room, and we see coordinates on the screen. Supervisor secrecy training is deleted off the screen, and the true destination of the coordinates is revealed. The very center of a celestial body called Solaris Ignitus, a bright, remote star. But back on Aromatica's surface, Dipper McGurk expertly pilots a fan boat through the waterlogged town of Dirk Holler. Sitting in a freshly made, brand new wheelchair with an equally new but still kind of junky scraps at his side. He absentmindedly throws a rubber ball for scraps out of the boat with one hand and steers the boat with the other. In the front is a cooler full of fish. Chris! Chris, I could use a hand with these. He pulls up to the front of a still completely ramshackle but brand new storefront with a sign that says, keeping it real, we're your number one fried muckfish joint. Come, coming, Dipper. Three angels on ridgeback, two muck buckets hot and ready. Chris plates the finished food and rushes out of the kitchen to help Dipper with his load. CRSU's weapons of war have been outfitted with a variety of kitchen utensils and home improvement tools. His left hand is currently replaced with a frying pan and his right hand is replaced with a mixer. Just as he puts the plates down, a small blur in the distance becomes Delilah. She picks up the plates. <sighs> All ready to lift to the north end. Here I go. As she rushes by Dipper, he stops her. D, you got smushed flies all over your face. We said 30 minutes or less, or you get it for free. We need to deliver. Dipper takes a greasy bandana from his back pocket and wipes the bugs off her face. All right, get a move on. Maybe I need some goggles or something. And Delilah's off. So I'm thinking instead of frying the muckfish in oil, if we take swamp gunk and mix it together, we could make a more flavorful and rich meal. Chris, you never cease to amaze me. I'm just a vessel. Dipper wheels backwards through the saloon doors of the restaurant with the fish cooler in his lap, waving hello to all of his regulars as he makes his way back to the kitchen. Inside the charming breakfast establishment, we see Papa Roach and Kid Roach sharing Cowdunga Bird omelets at a small corner table reserved just for the Roach family. I don't understand your confusion. Yeah, well, I, well, the thing was, is when I was in there, I was, I was talking to you, saying, "Oh, I can't wait for you to be here tonight, right?" And you were talking about tonight, and I kept thinking, "Oh, that's what I was saying." Right. So, but, but for me, I thought you was making a transaction that night. You know what I mean? No, I, like, I was. I wanted you at my party, a going away party, to share in the joy of that with you as we got off this plastic planet. Right, and this is just another classic roach miscommunication. I mean, we're always doing this. And honestly, if I would have backstabbed you correctly, I feel like you would have been proud of me. I would have been. You know, exactly. I would have been very proud. And I was real, I was only within 12, like 12 hours. That's significant. Thank you, that's all I wanted no, to hear. No, that was not a, that's not a compliment. No, no, that's, signi that's significant accomplishment is what no, you're saying. No, significant time away. And we zoom out from this picturesque scene settling on scraps posted up at a buoy, greeting fan boats full of hungry patrons. Welcome to Keeping It Real. Try our new Muckfish Royale with cheese. Slick 
with squalor Bound in shackles and a collar A person's felt A person's held As they cry out for a messiah Like a spicy jambalaya A righteous hoss Rises from the sauce is it him, or could it be? Is it him, or may that me? He's the hero of my youth. Hero of my youth. The salvation he'll supply you. That he rose from the bad, bad by you. The fan blades go around and around to take you. Around and round the band blades go around and round to take you home. Around and round the band blades go around and round to take you home. Around and round the band blades go. He'll make his presence known. Here he comes, he's the hero by you. This has been a Hero Club production, produced by Nick Williams, George Primavera, and Jack Quaid, with associate producers Marty Abbey Schneider and Dylan McCullum. Voice acting by George Primavera, Nick Williams, Lelia Symington, John Madison, Hannah Fagerbaki, Marcos Gonzalez, Gabe Greenspan, Benjamin Watts, Jackie Emerson, and Helen Laser. Theme song composed and produced by Matthew McCullum and performed by George Primavera. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod, Ben Doyle, and Matthew McCullum for their amazing music, Maychan Press for their genius D&D 5th Edition homebrew, Marty Abbey Schneider for his incredible artwork, and Ali Catanese, our hero. Follow us on Instagram at Hero Club Podcast, on Twitter at Hero Club Pod, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash hero underscore club, and check out our website, heroclubpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and welcome to the club. You will never own a home. Your retirement will be depleted. I have seen the data. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Holy shit. This, this is, is getting, getting too so real. so fucking real. <laughs> oh. Keep going, this is John. This is perfect. Going.